The mandate that I have today comes from Ecclesiastes, the first chapter, the third verse. The Bible says, What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? That's a question. What profit has a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? What is the use of it? If you read that in the message version, he says, What profit? What benefit? What's there to show for a lifetime of work, a lifetime of working your fingers to the bones? What's there to show? Some people don't ask themselves that question. What's there to show for your lifetime of work? What's there to show for your lifetime of working your fingers, for your late night trips, for your flights into conferences? What's there to show for your work in the garden, those of you are doing agriculture? Today, the kind of someone that I'm going to preach tonight would be a kind of someone I would preach or in a business symposium or in a conference of workers, people who are employed or in certain organizations or are employers of people in organizations or are business people in their own right from, you know, the conglomerate to the small and medium enterprises to the person dealing on the streets, the marketeer, whatever you're doing, whatever you're doing. For those of you who have something that you're doing with your hands, those of you can say that I work somewhere or I do some sort of work or I labor in some sort of way in life. I believe in hard work. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. I believe in hard work. I believe in labor. I believe in putting yourself to task to work. And I believe in proficiency. I believe in commitment to a particular goal or task. I believe in people who wake up every morning to go to work and come back home every day. I believe in that. I love that. I'm a hard worker myself. Hard worker myself. I believe in that. But... The question is, what is that to show for your lifetime of hard work? What is that to show for your labors? What is that to show for the bleeding hands and fingers? What is that to show for the time you wake up every morning and go to work every day? And some of you might think, I'm just talking about the car that you're driving and the house that you have and the fees that you have for your children to go to school. But this is deeper than that. And that's the conversation I want to have with us because not many people are able to see beyond this veil that has covered the earth. Somebody shout hallelujah. This is what I believe. And this is what the Lord has showed me. That not all labor is godly. Not all hard work is God given. Not all employment is inspired by God. Not all businesses, not all the things that we do with our own hands are really an inspiration of God. And there are many people across the world, many of you who are watching me right now and who will watch this video later, who don't know or are not sure for a fact whether what they're doing and how they're doing it really is of God, is inspired of God, and will bring the results that God has so desired for them as individuals. Not many people understand that there's a difference between the labors which are inspired and blessed of God and the labors which are either for bondage, affliction, curse. Some people will labor under the curse, under a particular curse. And I want to take us to that journey to help open our eyes. One time in my banking days, I remember a young lady who was hired on one of the teals. And she was a cashier. She was paying people off that and then many things happened in the organization and there was a stress that was impressed on her by her boss which pressure also comes from up we never know how much pressure comes but there are many people watching me right now who are under a certain sort of pressure organizations have targets to meet they set goals and then they give you scorecards uh, and then you have performance appraisals to see how you are performing as an individual. Are you doing better? Are you doing worse? And then there are pressures that these managers or supervisors have on people which are working because they also receive a certain pressure. A certain guy who plays golf almost every evening. 
And then, again, please, I emphasize this. I believe in hard work. And I believe in people committing themselves to work. But I want to open your eyes to something. So I remember a lot of pressure came for this young lady. And she became pregnant while she was working. And then in about the third month, because of stress, there was a lot of stress around. She had a very hard supervisor. She had a miscarriage. She lost her child. And the doctors told her, you were so stressed. Every sign was of a stressed person. I worked with people who were 30. When you looked at their eyes, you'd think they were 50. Because they'd been working for years. And some of them no longer understand the blessing of God and what that does to a man's labors versus the curse which is in the world. Because there are two systems. You're either under the system of Babylon or under the system of the kingdom of God. Like I said, a man who does not know God might not understand this sermon. Because the carnal man cannot receive neither discern the things of the spirit. They are spiritually discerned. The spiritually estimated. If you're not spiritual, you cannot understand this. I know of a guy who used to work so hard. I shared that story before in one platform. And uh, he was a hard worker. And he worked so hard that many times he would even skip meals because of the nature of his job. And while he was working one of those days, he developed ulcers because he was working so hard. And the ulcers grew and grew and grew. And on his retirement, the ulcers were so bad that he needed various operations and treatments. And then he started selling off all his property for the treatment until he sold his house, the one which he earned working hard. And after selling that house, he went on a surgeon's table for an operation and he died on that operation and left his wife and family with nothing. For all his 25 years of labor, he was sunk in a disease that he got while he was working at his job. He loved his job. He was a hard worker. Perhaps he was motivated like the rest. But certain things were not fitting for him as an individual in the way the blessing of God is supposed to work. I know people right now who are not sleeping. They're working so hard every day. We still have slavery in the world in 2021. You've heard of cases of human trafficking. They take people by force. And some, they're forced into uh, physical labor. Some have become sex slaves and they are transacted by men which are mad, because that's madness. You've heard of debt bondages. And these, in some parts of the world, are not common, but they are common in other parts of the world, like India, Pakistan, and the rest. And this is where they force certain individuals or families to work, to pay off an old debt. And some of these debts go beyond certain generations. They go beyond 10, 20 years of a span. Some of their parents took loans and they were not able to pay. And because they were not able to pay, the children are paying the loans of their fathers by hard work. And it's interesting that when we talk about debt bondage, they don't necessarily work for free. They're given little money to sustain them to work for years. In fact, I have read somewhere that about 50% of all labor is forced in some way. Now, of course, for the banker who works in a financial institution, who took a loan of a bank when a rate was set 25, 26%, and they said, no, for the staff, we shall put your loan at 10 or 11%. They don't see it. But I can see it. Because you see, for what the people in the world are paying for, for 24% annually, and the banker is given, you know, like a little leverage there, and they tell him, you know what, you're going to borrow this for 11% because you are our staff. Do you know what that means? It means that the day they ever quit that job, the day they are fired from that company, they're not going to be able to pay that debt because one, they're going to go jobless. Or two, if they leave that company and they join another business, which perhaps is not a bank or does not have the same terms, it means that the loan which was at 11% is going to go to 24% or 27%. It's going to eat into their income every month. And I saw people lose houses. I saw people lose properties when they lost jobs. And so some of them, it's not that they want to work there. 
but some of them it's because they have many debts and some of them even beyond what the banks have lent them they have borrowed from different people and so every time they go to work i one time worked with a fellow who almost 90 percent of his monthly income every time it came it went to pay debt so much as for his case they did not come to their family and say we need this in some sort of way it is a debt bondage that people right now, because of the manner of debt that they have, they should have closed certain businesses, but they cannot close certain businesses because it's the only way they can breathe to pay off certain debts because if they don't pay off those debts, they're sunk and they're gone. There are people who have big businesses, but they regret why they started those businesses. I found a man who is a millionaire in dollars, a billionaire in this nation, who told me, Grace, if there's one thing I would reverse, I should have not borrowed the money that I borrowed. Because right now, with all the assets that I have and the wealth that I have in the world, I cannot pay off certain debts, and yet I cannot stop working. So he wakes up every morning with a stress that he's going to work to pay off a debt, and his fear is that if one day he stops dead, he's going to leave his family a big problem, because they might also need many years to pay off those debts. That is demonic. No matter how beautiful the car you drive, no matter how beautiful the house you live in, that is demonic. And many people are not able to see and understand that not all labor is of God. I want to emphasize this, that hard work doesn't guarantee wealth. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't work hard, but hard work does not guarantee wealth. In fact, a report was released recently that 40% of the international workers live below the poverty line. They're working people but they have not made enough money to live above the poverty line. I believe for me, actually, I've seen it in my own eyes, especially for those of us who come from third world countries, the hardest working people are the least paid people. Think of the men and women who wake up every morning to go in business district, Chikubo, those of you who are in Uganda, the busiest place of trade in the country. They wake up at 4 a.m., 5, or some wake up at 3 a.m., by 4 or 5, they are downtown carrying heavy things taking them to the stores of the rich and the rich are sleeping in their bed not that it's their fault perhaps they did something to become wealthy but you see business has to move on so a guy has a truck 40 foot truck or perhaps two and these guys wake up at 2 a.m and they are carrying loads from 4 a.m or 5 a.m because i worked in chikubo for quite some time i saw this i saw this i saw this i personally used to go downtown at 5 or 6 a.m. in the morning, 4 a.m. in the morning. And I was supervising a group of guys which were offloading these things. And they carry these things from morning to about midday. They have a break of tea and food, and then they carry other things up to 6 or 7 in the evening. And they've worked for 10, 12, 13 hours of their life. They're going to go home with a tired body, put it down for 3, 4 hours, and wake up to work tomorrow. We saw it because we're also working for certain individuals, you see. And they were also doing their best because these men were having food on their table and educating their children and getting married and building, you know, houses and buying properties in their villages. So, yes, there was a win-win situation. But it took me so long to understand that not all labor is of God. I know people that I can actually look at straight in the eye and tell them that this thing you call work is actually demonic bondage. This thing that you call business is actually demonic bondage. It takes somebody who is spiritual to design these few signs, and some of which I'm going to explain to you today, and open the eyes of some of you, because it's the only way you can pray yourself out of a bondage that some of you have had for 10, 15 years, 20 years, and you don't even know that you're under bondage. Somebody shout hallelujah. In Psalms 107, if you read the Amplified Version, in Psalms 107, the 10th verse, he speaks of, the children of Israel that had sent themselves against the way of God. They had rebelled against God and they had broken his statutes and instruction. And then he gives an example of such and he says, from the 10th verse he says, Some sat in darkness and in the shadow of death being bound in affliction and in irons. Why? Because they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. Listen to verses 12. He says, Therefore he bowed down their hearts with hard labor. They stumbled and fell down and there was none to help. He bowed down their hearts with hard labor. If you read that in the message version, the Bible says, He gave them a hard sentence. 
and their hearts were so heavy and not a soul in sight was there to help them. So yes, they were working people, but these were men which were working under bondage. These were men that were working actually under a curse. They had rebelled against God and because of that, he handed them, he left them to go into a hard sentence. And the hard sentence there made their hearts heavy. Later on in a few minutes, I'll explain what the heart heavy means. He made their hearts so heavy, and not a soul in sight was there to help. They did not have enough hands to help them. So they labored and labored every day, every night. They're working for things that are not really theirs. They are building institutions that are for the benefit of strangers, and they have no history and attachment to these things. You go back to the story of the children of Israel when they were taken as slaves. Even though they were mighty before and they were richer before, they got to a point where they were enslaved by Pharaoh and the rest of Egypt and they became servants. They worked in mines, they worked in fields as slaves. They built buildings and they were slaves in Egypt. But none of these buildings they were building were an inheritance for their children. None of these buildings that they were building were connected to the two or three generations that were coming ahead for them. They were building for the Egyptian. What was the Egyptian doing when the Jew was building? Look at our children, our sons and daughters, our brothers and sisters that have gone in Muslim nations and they are going under the sponsorship of the leaders or the citizens of these Muslim countries. I've had stories of people, they call me at night and tell me, Apostle, they confiscated my passport. I'm not allowed to move. I'm not allowed to eat a certain way. I'm not allowed to sleep a certain time. I'm not allowed to dress a certain way. I'm not allowed to communicate to my family a certain way. I'm not allowed to go into certain spaces within that house. Why? Because I'm earning some money to treat my mother, which is in Africa, who has a chronic disease. And if I don't do that, my mother will die. Yes, I know that her heart is in the right place because they'll do anything to save their dying mother. Their heart is in the right place because they'll do anything to get the education of their children but they are under a certain bondage, they are under a certain slavery. They went on flight. These ones were not trafficked, no. They deliberately sold themselves into slavery because it was the only way they could earn a living. It is so painful. Why? Because they even live above some who are not enslaved. That means even those ones whom they live above are also in some way enslaved because they have not yet understood the blessing of God that maketh rich and addeth no sorrow. Somebody shout hallelujah. So we see that the children of Israel had a challenge when they rebelled against God and the judgments of God that then come towards them, put them in forced labor. So the question for some of you, are you working so hard because there is a purpose in your hard work or you're actually working so hard because you rebelled against God a certain way? You should ask yourselves those questions. Let me give you one of the signs of one bound in labor. I'll probably give you one or two of them because of the time that I have. One who is bound in labor. One who is not laboring according to the will and purposes of God. Number one, when a man's labor cannot allow him to rest. When a man's labor cannot allow him to rest. When you read the Bible, when God created the earth, the Bible says in six days he created the earth. And what happened? He rested on the earth on the seventh day. The Bible says he rested from his labor. Does that mean that God got tired? No. He was trying to establish a principle in the world that no matter how hard a man works, there has to be a time where they are given opportunity to rest. And biblically, there are opportunities within the day for a man to rest. The opportunities within the week for a man to rest, opportunities within a, uh, within a month or a year, or a particular season for a man to rest. God has given us rest as a mandate. At one point, you have to rest. In Psalms chapter 104, the 23rd verse, if you read from the Amplified Version, in Psalms 104, the 23rd verse, the Amplified Version, the Bible says, man goes forth for his work and remains at his task until evening. Man goes forth to his work and remains at his task until evening. And so that means God has designed us to work. It's okay to work during day and in the evening 
you have to be relieved of your tasks to go home, be with your family and rest. Or we have people who work overnight. Yes, if a man has worked overnight, then in the morning he should be able to go back to his children and family to rest. It's a principle of God. But you know, there are people who, by nature of their work, they're not able to rest either, by reason of how they were employed and the contracts that they have. They cannot rest. Or some, by reason of the needs that they have in the household, the debt that they have, the pressures that they have, the needs of their children, their family, their wives, their extended relatives, and some, actually, unfortunately, some just have a lust for money. And they have no common sense of when to rest because they love money. For the love of money is the root of all work, evil. So the Bible tells us that man is supposed to go out to work and remain at his task until evening. People are supposed to rest. So at what point in human history did we see that change? We see that change during the Industrial Revolution. When the Industrial Revolution came, it made men to work harder. It pushed men to work beyond seasons and natural lighting. Because the people who own these industries, the entities that control these industries, were hungry for pay. They were hungry for money. The demand of some of the products that these industries were making was bigger than what they could make at that point. And so they increased the labor force and they increased everything else, the, the other resources that are not human, to make sure that these industries are working to satisfy the people that need this product. So the demand was big and many of them actually were very selfish. Instead of saying, let us split these working hours for certain individuals, much as we're work making wealth, we need to allow people to rest by the principle of God. Many of them push these people to work hard as slaves. And that is what killed the issue of men going back to rest with their own families. Natural light speaks a certain way. Those who are spiritual, you design. There's a reason why God gave us the sun. He knew that during that time, that was when man should be able to see and do all that they're supposed to do. It says that when the darkness, the evening comes, a man has the ability to close their eyes and what and sleep because scientifically it's important for that darkness to come to allow the human brain to what to sleep and so we see scripturally that a man is supposed to rest every day of their working life somebody shout hallelujah exodus 20 verses 9 when it comes to the week he says six days shall thou labor and do all thy work but he says but on the seventh day in it thou shalt not do any work Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maiden servant, nor thy cattle, nor thy strangers that is within thy gates. That's why companies say, we're going to give you a weekend off. So you walk up to Friday, you go rest. Or some of you, you walk up to Saturday, and then they say, enjoy the Sunday and come back Monday fresh. Because it's a biblical principle. But there are companies that work from Monday to Sunday. And from Monday to Sunday. And some of them don't even grant their employees leave days. And it's okay if they're of the world, but it's not okay if you are born again and you make a man work 18, 19 hours, 20 hours, 12 hours, 17 hours, because you need to make money. Leave that for the world. God will supply all your needs. Again, I repeat, you don't need to work so hard to become wealthy. I know this is not popular with people who are money hungry, but it's the truth. And I'm not sorry about it, because even the people who are pushing these people to work are not working that hard. Do you agree? Yeah, they're not working that hard. Why don't they work that hard? Because a human being has to rest. Or if you have the kind of business or company that works day or night, then hire them differently. Give them the shifts, let a man work for his seven or eight hours and go back home and be with his family. You see what I'm saying? I even know people who have that in their contract that they're to work every day for six or seven hours or they are to rest every weekend but the nature of work that they do cannot allow them to rest so in contract and letter it is there you understand in contract and letter it is what it is there but in principle it's impossible because of the nature of tasks the job descriptions that they have they cannot allow them to rest the pressures that they receive so yes in contract they know you're supposed to work eight seven hours they cannot sue by the contract. If they complain, they're going to be fired. Now, notwithstanding, we have lazy people. Huh? 
there's a sermon on that and masking the spirit of what? Poverty. We have people who are lazy. Eh? They don't want to work hard and they have a lot of backlog. They don't do things in their own time. They're on the computers during the day, playing solitaire, chess, or any other things. And then they're receiving payments over the weekends. If you're that kind of person, I rebuke that spirit of you in Jesus' mighty name. Somebody shout hallelujah. But notwithstanding, notwithstanding, God by principle is showing us that we're supposed to what? To rest. Somebody shout hallelujah. In Psalms 127, verses 2, if you read the Amplified Version, he says, It is in vain for you to rise up early, to take rest let, to eat the bread of anxious toil, for he gives blessings. Have you read the Amplified? He gives blessings to his beloved in sleep. And I'm going to come later to that to help you understand the blessing of his own. For you to be able to see blessing within the labor of God. When you are God's own, when you're God's beloved, there is a blessing that should come in your labor. He's saying it's useless for a man to rise up so early, to take rest so late. Some people wake up very early at 5 or 6 a.m. They are up, they are running, and then they return back at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and then they sleep for 2, 3, 4 hours, and then they bathe in the morning, and then they go again, marathon, one week, two weeks, one year, three years, and God's saying that's not right. But you also have people whose toil is full of so much anxiety. They are restless at their workplace. They can fire you anytime. They can replace you anytime. They can cut your pay anytime. That is not of God. You're supposed to have peace and rest at your workplace. Somebody shout hallelujah. Why do you think, you know, researchers are telling you, why do you think that Monday is the day people reporting most sick? Why are people most sick on Monday morning? Those of you who work under some businesses or who have worked in, you know, organized institutions, you'll understand. People usually call in on Monday sick. Some are just so tired. They rested on Sunday. And then they cannot imagine just going to work just like that. Their body is telling them, look, sister, rest. I need to rest. And she says, uh -uh, I have to work. I need to rest. And then somehow she creates a sickness. I met somebody who told me that they killed their whole family because they got tired. <laughs> they killed their whole family. They made their children sick, their cousin, their uncle, you know, until one time some guy told them, but you told us your father had died. Which one has died this time? <laughs> but the truth is they're tired. Some of them are tired. Oh, of course, we have the lazy ones. But again, some people are really tired. And in fact, it's on record. Research will tell you that Friday is the day people fall less sick. It's the least likely day to fall sick. Why? Because weekend vibes are there. There's that exuberant feeling of I'm going into the weekend. People don't fall sick on Friday. Hardly. People don't fall sick on Friday. Even if they got COVID on Friday, they can't feel it. It becomes asymptomatic. Even if they got it on Monday and it's supposed to bring symptoms on Friday, they will not feel it. They have to go through the weekend and then like Sunday morning, the cough really comes. <laughs> Why? <laughs> some are lazy, but some honestly are overworked. Scientists, I read a document recently, have noted that people are able to even work to the age of 80. It's scientific that someone can actually keep a job consistently to the age of 80 if they work for 25 hours a week. If they work for 25 hours a week. So that is roughly five hours. If they're working Monday to Friday, that's five hours every day. If they can work five hours every day, they can give you up to 80 years of their lifetime of work. And scientists have also proved that people who work fewer hours give optimal productivity. People who work those few, five, six, seven hours, give optimal productivity. They're more productive than people who work for 8, 12, 20, 13 hours. And it's true. Why? Because the more a man is rested, the quicker they run. Some of you, if you have not read the story of Usain Bolt, he had failed to catch up with a certain speed. It's written somewhere in a story. He had failed to catch up in a certain speed. He's tried so much, but he could not catch up in a certain speed. And his coach tells him, but if you learn to rest, you'll break that record. If you learn to rest, long enough, you will get the record that you desire. He learned to sleep. They say he 
this guy could sleep up to 12 hours of his day. So when he gets on that track, he's another person. Why? Because you run as fast as you rest. You can only run as fast as you rest. They tell you the most successful footballers, Messi, Ronaldo, LeBron. You go read their sleeping statistics. In fact, now, <laughs> under contract, they're obligated, some of them, to actually have enough sleep. They notice that they cannot monitor your sleeping. They can't invest millions of dollars in you because they know you'll fail. Somebody shout hallelujah. So rest is a very integral part of that. I was reading, I took time to read through nations, eh? different nations, and their work time. And I was amazed that Netherlands has the shortest work week in the world. The shortest. That means they work for 29 hours a week. 29 hours. A nation called Netherlands. 29 hours a week. It's about 5.8 hours a day if they're working for five days of that week and they have their weekend off. And then I started to look at the facts concerning that nation and I realized, one, they're among the happiest people in the world. Is that a coincidence? No. An Oxfam report showed that they are the healthiest people in the world. Healthiest. Those guys don't die young. They live long. Some nutritional aspects, but there are also aspects of their work and rest. Yet, in the story, they are also the most active people in the world. So some people think that going to work means that you're active. No, actually, some of you wake up, sit on desks the whole day, and then your body even gets more fat, and then you go back home. These guys who are working less are the most active people in the world. You have more bicycles in Netherlands than people. More bicycles. They are working out, they're doing things to keep their bodies fit. But they're the happiest people. Are they the poorest nation? Answer me. And they richer than many nations in the world? Yeah. That's what we're saying. That's what we're saying. And I remember in my olden days when we were working, they used to tell us, learn to work smart and not hard because some of you are just hard workers, but you're not smart. And because some of you, your brains can't catch up. <laughs> you find yourself doing more than you're supposed to do. Somebody shout hallelujah. I don't know that anybody here has heard of something they call the Karoshi phenomenon. The Karoshi phenomenon. Now, the Karoshi phenomenon comes out of an experience that was studied in Japan. Because in Japan, by reason of culture, they have a certain understanding about work that is so contrary to truth. They believe that the harder a person works, the better they are and they become. And so, much as some of them have contracts of eight, seven hours, people work for 60, 80 hours a week. 80 hours a week, 70 hours a week, 90 hours a week. And so they started to discover that people seated on tables were just falling, boom, and then they died. Somebody has been working for one week, two weeks, and then he has fall, boom, and then they die. He has folded. And when they take them to hospital, they are not sick. It's just death by overwork. Karoshi, that's the word. Karoshi means death because of overworking or death by overworking. And I read a report in, I think it was 2016, where they lost 10,000 people in one year because of working hard. 10,000 people. Statistics show that every year we lose close to 800,000 people who are dying because of hard work. They fall dead. And many of them either have heart failure, cardiac arrest, strokes. So you see that the heart getting heavy in Psalms, why the Bible says their hearts became heavy, they work so hard and their bodies cannot hold. And boom, they get heart attacks, cardiac arrest, and then they just fall dead. I read a story of a young girl who was 31 in Japan, and she even wrote on media, social media, I'm tired, I feel like I want to die. And then she committed suicide. So for those who are not dying of heart disease, for those who are not dying of you know, health issues. Some of them are committing suicide. Somebody just gets tired of working and they go hang themselves because the world demands so much for them and the needs that they have for their families. For many things that somebody can say, but why would somebody kill themselves? Oh no, 
you don't know what people go through. You don't know how much pressure people go through when they're working. But people have killed themselves working. Some are not committing suicide, but some are killing themselves even without knowing because they need to work hard. That is demonic. That is demonic. Proverbs 10 verse 16. The labor of the righteous tendeth to life. The labor of the righteous tendeth to life. Somebody say the labor of the righteous tendeth to life. And I shall have life as I labor in Jesus name. May you never be put in a situation where you work yourself to death. Uh, 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 uh. Not a child of God. Not a child of God. Not a seed of the Almighty. Somebody shout hallelujah. There are people who might not understand this, especially if you are Christian, you come from a rich family, your father had money, your mother has money, you're in your father's business. You might not understand this. But some of us who began from scratch understand it. Some of us who began from zero understand it. Some of us who are not handed over capital to work or did not have relatives who were rich and were connected to governments, we know what that means. People are working so hard in the world. I know people who are doing four or five jobs at a go. And how they do it, we don't even know. They come from one shift and get on trains and then go to another and then get from one shift and get on trains and then go to another. And they will never have enough. That is why when I'm emphasizing this, Christians, I need to help you understand the power of the first fruit. When we teach about first fruit, some of you think, oh, you know, these churches. No, 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 it's not about the churches. It's for you. I don't eat the Lord's first fruit. I never ate the Lord's first fruit. Every year, even as a ministry, we give our first fruits. The Bible says, and of all the first fruits and of all things, of every oblation, of every sort of oblation, the Bible says, shall be the priest, and you shall give unto the priest the first of your dough, that he may cause the blessing, the blessing to settle in your house. The blessing. He didn't say a blessing. He said the blessing. The Bible says it is the blessing of the Lord that maketh rich and addeth no sorrow. Not a blessing, not blessings. No, it is that, that, the blessing of God that maketh rich and addeth no sorrow. When the children of Israel, in Deuteronomy 26, verse 6, when they were testifying about what God had done for them after their deliverance in Egypt, these are the words they said, if you read in the Amplified Version. They said, and the Egyptians treated us very badly and afflicted us and laid upon us hard bondage. These are they speaking. And when we cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers, the Lord heard our voice and looked on our affliction and our labor and our cruel oppression because their labor was demonic. And the Bible says, and the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with great awesome power and with signs and with wonders. And the Bible says, and he brought us into this place and gave us this land. Listen, he brought them into a place they did not work for and he gave them a land that they did not work for. And the Bible speaks of a land flowing with milk and honey, with no bees and cows. Are you hearing me? And he said, and now verse 10, behold, I bring the first fruits of the ground which you, O God, have given me and you shall I'll set it down before the Lord, your God, and worship before the Lord, your Father, God. When you get the revelation of God's deliverance, nobody will tell you to give your first fruit. Or the man that gives a first fruit is a man that has understood his deliverance. It is a sign that you agree with God, that you are free from the system of Babylon. When a man learns to give first fruit, you cannot live under that curse. You cannot live under that curse you cannot work like the men of this world or if you do it's only for a while god will get you out he'll get you out that's your first fruit this is principle it's not me read your bible read your bible wherever you take it by the way you don't need to bring it to my church but wherever you do give the lord his first fruit give the lord his first fruit and the priest should pronounce something over you and say cause that thing to settle in your house Somebody shout hallelujah. Yeah. I have a whole teaching on that, on secrets of divine providence. The people say, oh, me, I tithe. Wonderful. It's good to tithe. It's biblical to tithe. Somebody shout hallelujah. It's biblical to tithe. But the first fruit is biblical also. It's biblical also. Look at anyone who eats the first fruit. They, in some sort, are dealing with some curse. In some way. Majority of them. Or consequently, one day it happens. Somebody shout hallelujah. 
And this is the hard truth about a blessed life. When a man is living under a blessed life, whether you want it or not, there are doors that will open without your effort. There are things that should come to you without your labor. There are opportunities that should happen to you not because you're a hard worker. That's a blessed life. That's just the way of a blessed life. You know, the world will teach you and tell you, oh, you know, without hard work, you won't do this. Some of you want free things. Listen, the blessed life will attract certain free things. It won't take you away from hard work, but it will attract certain things that should come without your effort. It's the only way. It's the only way you can be blessed. Or it should be that you are the blessed of the Lord. It's principle. The Bible says in Joshua 24, the 11th verse, again, if you read in the Amplified Version, now he's speaking to the children of Israel. He says, you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho, and the men of Jericho fought against you, as did the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Gagishites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites, and I gave them into your hands. Verses 12, I sent the hornet, that is the terror of you. Yeah? See, when the enemies of Israel set themselves against Israel, God gave Israel the victory over their enemies, and then he sent the hornet, that is a terror of them. They became like a terror to their enemies. And the Bible says, that terror drove the two kings of the Amorites out before you, but it was not by your sword or by your bow. Huh? It was not by your sword or by your bow. It was not by your hard labors that I gave you certain victories. Because those are blessed people. Not everything that comes should come because you work hard. It doesn't mean that you're not going to be a hard worker, but God will always outgive your labor. That's a blessed life. Somebody say it's mine. Verses 13. He says, I have given you a land for which you did not labor. I've given you a land for which you did not labor. And he says, and I've given you cities that you did not build. He says, and you dwell in them. You eat from vineyards and olive yards that you did not plant. Why? Because ye are the blessed of the Lord. Not every vine that you eat you shall plant. Not every olive that you eat you shall plant. Not every house that you live in you will build. Not every land or property that you have you shall buy with your own money. God has promised that he shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. Somebody shout amen. amen. Shout glory to God. Not every property that I have, I bought with my money. In fact, lately I realized I no longer buy with my money. Yet I don't beg. And yet I have the money. <laughs> Glory to God! Give somebody a high five and tell him they're talking about me. Type it on YouTube or Facebook and say, they're talking about me. If you're on television, at least say it to the air. If you're alone in your house, say, they are talking about me. Somebody shout hallelujah. I want something in my head and somebody brings it. And some come in billions of shillings. Some come in hundreds of millions of shillings. I have failed. I have failed. I have failed to outgive God. One time I got some money. There was a, something I was going to buy. And as I was going to purchase it, somebody came and said, the Lord gave me a vision that you need this particular thing. And I said, huh, praise God. And he said, and he told me to give you all the money for that thing. Oh my God. Of course I pretend, yeah, God bless you. Thank you for your obedience. You're a good man. And after that, I went back home. Oh, I started to dance alone. Hallelujah. Why? Because I am blessed. Tell your neighbor, I am blessed. God wants to give you things your hard work will never give you. Oh, there are people we started working with when I started working years ago. Some of them are still in the same positions. Some of them were even in higher positions. But right now as I'm speaking, they are lower than the people who are below them. Because it's not about hard work. It's not about how many books you read. It's about the blessing of the Lord. Somebody say, I'm the blessed of the Lord. In the book of Psalms 105 verses 42 he says for he remembered his holy promise so this is not about you uh-uh uh-uh it is the lord that giveth us power to make wealth that he might establish the covenant that he made with our forefathers when you look dirty god feels ashamed 
when Abraham looks at him. Because there's a promise he made to Abraham and he's seen. Somebody shout hallelujah. When you sleep hungry and the landlord tells you, I'm chasing you out tomorrow. Abraham looks at your father and says, what did you promise me? And then God says, he disobeyed. The promise still stands. Somebody shout hallelujah. Don't be on the wrong side of God's purposes. So he says, for he remembered his holy promise and Abraham his servant. And he brought forth his people with what? With joy. And he's chosen with what? With gladness. The Bible says, verse 44, he gave them lands of the heathen and they inherited the labor of the people. Oh, 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 oh. That is so deep. That is so deep. That is so deep. That is so deep. Oh, no, no. It's not the houses. He talked about the labor of the people. The labor of the people. That means there's somebody who is not sleeping for you. Aha, uh -huh. you got it. There's somebody right now. They're working hard. They're even boasting. I'm a hard worker. But oh, eventually it's going to come to you. Eventually it's going to come to you. Oh, that's not fair. Listen, they have a choice too. They can receive the same God. Hey, they can take the same God. They can choose to receive that God today. And those things will turn for them. But, but, they think that they can fulfill their own way and will without the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's not how it works. The Bible says that he gave them the inheritance of the labors of the people and that they might observe his statutes and keep his laws. And the man says, praise ye God. Oh. Oh, can I prophesy? Allow me to say this. You remember last week when I said that some of you are going to break into very big projects? This week I have received testimonies of people with projects. Somebody sent me a message and said, Apostle, I have been chasing for a project for two years and a half. They could not reply, but they called me like as if they were under force to call me. A lady walked in my office the other week. I pronounced something over her and her husband a couple of months ago. They had gone to zero. And I said something, but she told me the way your God fulfilled. They called my husband at 4 a.m. as though they didn't even care whether he was sleeping. And he was awake. Are you hearing me? Synchronized. Let me say this. You are entering a world, a season, a time, a dispensation where you're going to enter houses you have not built, vineyards you have not planted. You're going to eat of vines that you didn't plant, of olives that you did not plant. You're going to become directors of companies that you did nothing for. You're going to become shareholders of businesses that you have not done anything for. It won't take away your hard labor. But it's going to separate you from the children of this world. It's going to separate you from the system of Babylon. You will not die on your desks. That job that you're doing, I don't know who I'm speaking to. I might not be speaking to everyone, but there's somebody I'm speaking to. That job that had enslaved you, tonight in the mighty name of Jesus, I break its power and influence over your destiny. And let me decree and declare, that a better door is going to open to you in a few weeks, in a few days, if you believe in a few hours, that's going to relieve you from struggle and strife. May you never eat the bread of sorrow again. The Bible calls it the bread of sorrow. You know, the people who make a lot of wealth, but even as they make it, there's a lot of problems. There's a lot of problems. You make money, and then this one person falls sick. You make wealth, and then that's, then that's when your cousin needs an operation, or your sister, or your wife, or your children. You've not had the opportunity to even enjoy the wealth that God has given you. There are people who make so much money, but they don't even have time to sit over a meal with their own children and their the, the, the children are being raised by the world because they need to work hard. Tonight, by reason of the anointing, I have broken that bondage off your life in the mighty name of Jesus. Some of you are going to be so shocked about how money is going to come. Some of you are going to be shocked about how wealth is going to increase in your life. 
effortlessly god is going to introduce you i see jobs that are going to come without application not that you shouldn't apply there are probably people who are called to apply but there are also some i'm talking to who are not going to apply in the name of jesus christ i never looked for jobs in my life they always called me and they said we have an opening come why because i'm blessed of god i am blessed of god for some of you right now i'm commanding those that have your stuff to release it in the mighty name of jesus for those that have worked for your wealth to release it. It doesn't mean that you'll not be a hard worker. No. Work hard. But I'm decreeing upon your life that God is going to give you more than you could ever work for. God is going to give you more than your hands could ever do. It says that one day when they ask like Ecclesiastes 1.3 says, What profit hath a man of his labor which he taketh under the sun? You will boldly say that God has given me more than I could ever have worked for. Ministers of the gospel. This applies to you as well. May God overwhelm you. I say, may God overwhelm you. May God overwhelm you. May things start to come so effortlessly that people will ask you, how did you do it? Where did it pass? How did that come? And you'll tell them, not by might, nor by power, but by the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord. If you know that something has happened in your life, I want to give you 10 seconds to celebrate like you know something has happened. Yes, do something that your neighbors will say, but this man is quiet. What has happened in his house? For the Bible says they shall go out with joy. Glory to God! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Tell your neighbor it is mine. Tell them I am rich. I am blessed. Tell them God is overwhelming me. Tell them it's going to be effortless. Tell your neighbor it's going to be so easy. Oh, tell your neighbor it is come to me. In the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're sick in your body and you need healing. Receive healing right now. Be healed. Be healed. Be healed. Be healed. Those of you who are in debt, I ask for a miracle that clears your debt. Either somebody will pay it off, somebody will forgive you for it, or God is going to go open a door that is bigger than your debt in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray for those of you who have contracted diseases because of hard work. Some of you developed hypertension or ulcers or heart diseases. I command that spirit to lose you right now in the name of Jesus. You're free in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, because it is done. If you've never given your life to Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Just repeat these words after me. Just repeat these words after me because the Bible says there is no, there is no name given unto men wherewith they're saved, says the name of Jesus Christ. No name is given whereby they must be saved only through Christ not through any man or a woman it's only through Jesus I want you to repeat these words after me say Lord Jesus I thank you because you shed your blood for my sins and you were raised for my glory I receive you tonight as my personal Lord and Savior Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 41 466 
1-800-242-4291 or email us at funerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.funero.org or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Make Manifest.